why don't we go along and we'll introduce each other. Just tell, tell the, the, the group what you do and kind of your relation, and then we'll jump right into a bunch of questions because we want to talk about what's happening now and hopefully get into a little bit of what's happening in the future. So we're not going to, we are going to take a look at the past to try to see where we're going, but we're going to try to be very much in the present today. But Kay. Sure. Hi everybody, I'm Kay and I'm co-founder and VP of operations at Counterpunch Studios. Um, at Counterprint Studios, we basically come up with technical out-of-the-box solutions to allow our clients to produce digital content at a new benchmark of timelines and budgets uh, to meet new demand. We're going to get a little bit more detail about what that means here. Yeah. So, okay, Nick? Hi, everyone. I'm Nick Sells. I'm the Global Head of Performance for YouTube Original Content, and recently I now also am responsible for our Hollywood movies and series, as well as live sports. And that really means three things. First and foremost, uh, I sit on the strategy side and help figure out uh, what types of projects we should green light. Um, from there, my team is responsible for all of the modeling, for trying to understand what success looks like across all of those different premium entertainment initiatives. And then lastly, my team also then post-launch uh, is responsible for all the analysis to understand whether or not something actually was successful and to try and understand the underlying drivers behind that success. So we can actually ask him why this failed, <laughs> and he should know. Mm -hmm. and fabulous to have someone who's directly involved in using, uh, using data today in media, and what better to have you two person. Dennis. Dennis, uh, Dennis Miller, I'm the youngest person on the panel. <laughs> oh, you guys think that's funny. That's really funny. <laughs> no, I've been Harry Sloan's driver for about 10 years. So <laughs> I just want to put that out there, and it's been great. A lot of good stock tips and stuff. <laughs> but, um, These uh, facts. <laughs> uh, currently, I oversee a uh, set of production companies. We make about 40 shows for 22 networks right now. And uh, it includes shows like American Idol and So You Think You Can Dance and Leah Remini's Scientology show and all sorts of crazy things for all the players today. And prior to that, I was a venture capitalist for about 15 years total in Boston, New York. And then before that was a senior executive in the media business. So I've uh, been, been on a couple different sides of the business. So we're going to go back to Dennis about how uh, data was used. And, and how it is being used now, because he's actually been living the, the data change for the last 10 years. I'm <laughs> just joking. <laughs> Warren. Uh, Warren Seeger, I'm the co-founder and CEO of Parrot Analytics. Uh, we're the leading global content analytics provider in the industry, and I'm really jealous of Michael's picture. I thought they, they told us we could bring pictures like that. I, I, I That's really climbing. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I mean, it was successful, I made it back. Fantastic, <laughs> good, good, good to have you back, Mike. Okay, thanks, Ward. Um, and very understated, but Parrot is a, 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 an upcoming uh, data company that's uh, gonna make a lot of waves here, but based in New Zealand, as you could hear from the slight accent there. Um, I was trying hard to hide it, but. Yeah, well, the more you're gonna talk, the more it'll come out. Cool. I wanted to start off with what each of you see as sort of the trends that are personally affecting you in the media world today. Let's step way back, but jump into what, what's happening to your lives around, uh, and I wanna talk about technology and then we'll get into data, but sort of, let's start with you, Kay. Kind of, you're in a place that you're trying to disrupt an industry. Um, so tell us about how you're doing it and what really is the driver behind it. Uh, I'll try. Um, <laughs> you so will. There's, there's a voracious new appetite for content. And this is a new appetite for a quantity of content within shorter timelines and kind of a lower budget pain threshold. Just because um, all of the studios, all the companies, all the content providers are trying to put out as much content as possible, but save on time and cost so they can squeeze even more content in. Um, there's a new binge watching culture, you know, nobody goes on and watches one episode, they watch 10 and then they want the next season. So there's, rather than a few episodes being ordered, there's two seasons and a certain amount of minutes and then extra content. On top of that, with the new digital age, what we're seeing is that um, the audience wants to reach out and touch the character. They no longer are satisfied with a few minutes of behind the scenes content on a DVD. They wanna have social media presence and they wanna have 
a, a, you know, a blog update and uh, just current events and happenings. They want to understand the character. They want to connect with it. They want to, through their own screen, reach out and talk, basically, to these characters. So what that's created is a need for this content to be created quickly, affordably, and what that's caused is for some studios to go to you know, tax cuts and different countries with lower um, cost of living, and then other studios like ours, where we don't want to move to Canada, we don't want to move to India, that's caused us to buckle down and really um, invest in technology that's gonna allow us to produce this content with fewer bodies in a shorter amount of time. So, tell us, go be, right into the, the technology side. You're actually using a game engine that's to right. create film or television. Explain how that, because that's fairly new. It's very, How very long ago new. did that start happening in, talk about uh, it's, 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 that evolution. It's been coming, but I would say what we found in our industry is that only in the last five years are clients becoming more comfortable with us mentioning even in a pipeline that we're going to use a game engine for the rendering side of things, that we're going to use Epic's Unreal or anything else like that. Um, because previously, um, they were used to any content coming out of a game engine looking kind of, you know, sketchy. Uncanny Valley, yeah, Uncanny Valley sketchy. But now, all of these companies are really advancing and, and allowing the artists to go in and, and create their own content and really push the envelope. With our company specifically, um, we're able to use this game engine to render in photorealistic, render in hyperreals, render in stylized. As data comes out with what the audience is requesting, like this year they want adventure shows for ages X to X, or next year they want an animal show. Um, we go in and we produce this content for our clients. We will create a character that looks squashy, stretchy, and with the same technology, create a character that looks realistic and can be like a digital double or create an animal that has fur, which hasn't been done in these game engines before. Mm -hmm. Each project that we're taking on is like a puzzle. You know, we're not quite sure how we're gonna do it, but we figure it out. Great. And clients are becoming bolder because they are wanting to be the first one out with something. Whereas before, uh, there was this Catch-22 where we had NDAs and everybody wanted to see a sample of something before they would commit, but we couldn't show them, and now, I can boldly just say, you know, that hasn't been done before, but we can try. And they're willing to do it, just to be the first. All right. That's interesting. Nick, what, what trends do you see that kind of surprise you or, or intrigue you? Sure, it's a great question. Um, I probably focus on three different areas. I think the first is what success looks like is beginning to change in the media landscape. So if you think about traditional broadcast television and the period that came after with basic cable and then premium cable, the media business was always heavily, heavily focused on trying to reach as many eyeballs as you possibly could. And then on the monetization side, kind of cutting up the distribution windows to maximize revenue across multiple um, kind of distribution periods over the long term. And I think what you're increasingly beginning to see now, especially with the growth and advent of subscription video on demand models, is you know, many companies would rather have a show that has one million extremely dedicated, passionate viewers than 20 million very transient viewers. And so as the business models have continued to evolve, I think what success looks like has also begun to change drastically and will also continue to change drastically, um, specifically as new bundling packages are created. Um, you know, you might green light a show specifically with the goal of retaining subscribers from an earlier show that's launched a few months later. And so, you know, it, I think what success looks like is a lot more nuanced and it's also continuing to change with the advent of more business models. Um, secondly, I think what it means to be a modern day media company is changing a lot. And I think about that through two lenses. The first is obviously, you know, as Michael mentioned, I work for YouTube and we've seen firsthand kind of the growth of what I call like the personality driven media company. You know, to some extent it's what Oprah did, you know, many, many years ago, but you've just seen an explosion of it where you have these individual creators, the um, Lily Sings of the World or um, you know, other YouTube stars, and they've built an entire media brand anchored on their personality as an individual. 
that today gets more reach and more engagement than any number of traditional media brands. And I think as that begins to evolve, the way that you grow a personality-driven media business in today's day and age is very different from kind of um, a, a traditional um, production-based business or kind of non-personality-based business. And I think the second evolution that you're seeing is, you know, you have the big distribution platforms that they're trying to be everything to everyone, right? Like Netflix is spending over $12 billion of content um, and that's like their, their actual spend that year from an accounting standpoint. And in doing that though, they don't really stand for anything. And as more and more players are entering, Apple has their big announcement coming on March 25th. You know, obviously Richard just left HBO because AT&T was pushing him to create, you know, double, triple the amount of content that HBO was creating. In order to break through, you're going to need um, media companies that have really strong brands because they'll need that connection directly with the consumer in order to be able to stand out from the insane amount of content that's being created today. And I think a great example of that is Vice Media, where if you go to an individual and you say, what is like your top five favorite shows on Vice? Even people that love Vice kind of struggle to say it because the individual show doesn't matter. All of Vice's value from like an equity standpoint is in the brand name Vice. And the reason it works is because they have that strong brand. And so any show they produce, even if it's just a single or a double, is driving value back to that brand name. And so you don't, you, you get out of this lottery system where everything needs to be a Game of Thrones hit in order to be a success. And so I think media companies that are personality driven and that also understand the value of brand will be widely successful. Uh, and then I think the, the third thing um, really comes down to how you think about engagement. Where it used to be, you know, you, you launch the new season in the fall, you know, if it's broadcast, you have like a 22, 24 episode season, and then you go off in the summer and then you come back again. And increasingly, what you're seeing is the most successful shows, that engagement happens 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. You're going to the Comic-Con to re-engage with them. You're releasing teaser con content throughout the season. And again, that, that becomes necessary because there's just such a glut of content that's existing that you need to maintain that relationship with your audience, even outside of the traditional season release cycles in order to be successful. So I'm gonna put a pin on two things there, uh, viewership versus engagement, because I wanna talk about measure, how do you measure those two because they're very different because sure. we've always heard about Nielsen and viewership that doesn't really measure engagement. And then Vice, my good friends are involved with my Vice and their brand value has done this. So <laughs> I might come back and argue Let's a little bit about that one. Dennis, yes, what do sir. you see happening in the trends that just kind of get you, make you stay up at night? That, I know that's hard, but, uh, but <laughs> <laughs> kind of gets you interested and intrigued. Yeah, I mean, I think we, I see it from a couple of different sides. I'm on the board of a, the largest broadcaster in the U.S. called Next Star, which just bought Tribune. So we have 221 stations all together. And as Harry mentioned earlier, it's a multi-billion dollar, you know, TV marketplace still. Um, we have <laughs> the most CBS affiliates and CW affiliates and the second most Fox affiliates. So we got a pretty good view. Uh, we never signed, we haven't signed a Nielsen contract in five years, just to give you a sense of where that's going. One that's, you know, it's been a very tough monopoly to deal with for many years, is the only game in town. They don't measure effectively off, off television viewing, so getting the data from mobile devices and getting that in an integrated fashion has still been problematic. So we've kind of left it to the advertisers to do that. Um, but I would say in the next three to four years, there will be a sea change in local advertising ratings here because the old days, you'd go to a car dealer, you tell the car dealer his picture and that corny ad is gonna show up at 3.30 in the afternoon. You'd have a golf game or a boozy lunch and the deal was done, you got your money and it was a great business with 50% margins. Still a great business, 36% margins. Uh, Retrans revitalized the business, but now to sell the local advertiser, we did a survey when I was in Boston and we went down to Cohen Optical, a local optical chain in the Northeast, and we said, how many people come and call on you 
for your business? And they said about 12 people a week. Yellow Pages, radio, television, local Google people that were sent into the market to kind of stir things up, all the digital marketing companies. And so you're a local proprietor running an optical store on Newberry Street in Boston. How do you decide where to put your money? And we now see about 15% of local goes to digital. That's going to grow at a low base at a much faster pace than broadcasting. Broadcasting is a kind of a steady state, mature business on the advertising side, but thankfully a guy named Donald Trump has given TV a revitalized advertising base because he's added another 20% of political advertising to the mix. But we, in order to compete, uh, we have to have digital tools to be able to tell Co and Optical why they should be on the local TV station. And that is really early days. It's trying to mesh two very different cultures Mm -hmm. hasn't worked that well to date. There's no huge success stories out there. Um, but that is going to be something to keep an eye on as broadcasting tries to kind of reinvent itself uh, in this brave new world. Very interesting. All right. Well, there's tons of things that have been said. And yes, obviously, sir. you have your own point of view or mind of what's kind of challenging you or thinking. Yeah. So our, our standpoint, our viewpoint is always, is always going to come from the point of using data and insights to drive decisions. Um, you know, there's a, a bunch of overlapping themes in, in what's, what's being said. I think what I would add to that are sort of three points, if I were going to summarize it, in terms of trends. One, globalization. Two, localization. And three, monetization. Um, globalization is the formats that you know you mentioned earlier are becoming global phenomena and what we're seeing is content traveling faster than ever before right is that what the internet has done what this new world of content distribution has done is allow <coughs> ideas and stories to cross borders faster than ever before and so globalization is is Obviously, we've been seeing it for a number of years. Uh, I think formerly had people here when, when Netflix's subscriber, international subscribers overtook their domestic subscribers and that showed that actually you can build a global business um, over the internet fairly quickly. What it does mean from a content production standpoint, from a content investment standpoint, from a programming standpoint, from out in this town, is actually that you can now, if you have the right insights, create content with a global view that actually is going to resonate with specific audiences and specific markets. The inverse of that is localization, right? And so that's where not everything works everywhere. And that's where these, you know, there's a bunch of examples, these, these uh, original series that are in foreign languages, right, that, are, that actually resonate quite well here. So if you look at, I don't know, you pick any non-English language TV show that any of you may watch, and if you watch Netflix, it could be like Casa de Papel or Money Heist. Um, you know, that Spanish title aired on a Spanish network, picked up, turned into a global hit. The cost of that from a licensing point, from a programming point of view, was thousands of dollars per episode, right? And you think of the return to a global platform that can monetize it is astronomical. Now, what does that mean for formats? Well, you know, a while ago we published an article that said, oh, there's, um, there's actually a Korean format called the, the Masked Singer um, in South Korea that was traveling really well outside of South Korea before it got picked up here as a, as a domestic format here. And, uh, and you know, when we first published Insights, people were like, what, really? That's a, why would that be trending here? Um, I remember a couple of years ago, um, I was on a panel similar to this, and someone asked me for an example. Hey, can you give me an example? You guys measure global data um, and uh, global audiences and what, what everyone is interested in and pick up trends. Can you give us an example? And I said, yeah, sure. Um, SCAM was actually a Norwegian TV show um, that uh, at the time no one had known uh, about out here in the US. And, uh, and I said, well, we're seeing that the title really uh, traveled. People are engaging with it. And then 
someone did the research and, and, and were like, well, no, that can't be right because Scum is a Norwegian TV show. Um, it doesn't even have English subtitles. It only airs in Norway, doesn't have English subtitles. How the hell could it be traveling outside of Norway? How could it be? Turns out that when we actually dug into the data that people were creating what, what, what they call fan titles, which is, you know, they, they download the, title, the TV show and a bilingual person creates an English subtitled version of it, slaps it on top of the show, re-uploads it, and then it spreads. And then people start watching our popcorn time and all the file sharing websites and what have you. Um, so, so globalization and localization are sort of two forces that are now, that can be quantified for the first time, I think, uh, well, more than ever before. Um, and the monetization is something that Nick touched on, which is it's the definition of success is now changing. And so from a monetization standpoint, as long as you have a really clear idea about what that means for you, then you can now make safer bets, right? You can, what is the hit rate like? Is 67% of all fir first run TV shows are canceled in the first season out here, right? I mean, that's a ridiculous hit rate. I'm told that's the second, you mentioned you were watching these, that's the second highest new project failure rate, second only after the venture capital industry, <laughs> the television <laughs> industry. Okay. And for a half a trillion dollar industry, there is a tremendous amount of wastage that goes on and inefficiency. And I think that's the sort of the third trend that I see in terms of using global uh, insights to, to de-risk investments. Let's move into data. Um, Dennis, give a little perspective on how your life or your use of data has changed when you were a media executive with, with, uh, in, the, in the TV industry, you know, not that long ago. And then now you're basically making and selling TV shows? Uh, I think in the early days, we would wait for the networks to send us the overnights, and that was a very nerve-wracking process in the morning. <laughs> and, uh, and you would uh, wait and wait and wait, and then they would come across, and it was usually a simple number of how many households and how many adults 18 to 49, we're watching the show, and it And that was a panel. That was basically That a was a 5,000 5, home 000. panel. Mm -hmm. uh, and think about that. With, at the time, there were probably, I don't know, 70, 80 million you know, TV homes there. <laughs> and that was, uh, that was all the data that everyone was utilizing. And there was one company in town providing it there. So great business for them. But it was all based on those 5,000 people reporting in. And it always confounded everyone why such a small panel would be statistically significant. Uh, and then we moved to the cable universe when I was running TNT. Um, we tried to get the set-top box information from Comcast and Time Warner and all of those folks because that was the holy grail of what are these people watching and are they tuning in or tuning out and this is much better than the 5,000 person panel and they said absolutely not, can't have that data. Uh, certainly not on a direct basis. We'll you know, we'll provide it anonymously in different kinds of buckets that you can go and try to access. But it kept uh, the business in a certain kind of lockdown state here, and that was for 20 years. And I think the only thing that kind of got it, because there was no social media, there was no uh, Live Plus 3, there was no DVRs in these early days, so it was really what happened the night before would really determine the fate and then how that trended of any of these TV shows. And that, you're right, that was the 70% failure rate. Just reminded me that I chose two careers with 70% failure rates. <laughs> <laughs> it's really, really, really intelligent. And, uh, and, then, um, and then, lo and behold, I think the advent of the, you know, the cable box, and now, obviously, with most programming being viewed off the television you know, here, so we're getting on all these other devices, changed everything. A couple of relatively creaky companies, uh, Rent Track and Comscore, were the first attempts to go and capture a lot of this data. Uh, the SVOD people very cleverly, particularly Netflix, said, we're not going to tell you. And that has become a huge, huge conundrum in the business right now. So if the old days, we had a show in our library called Seinfeld, uh, when we had <laughs> bought the company, Sony had bought Castle Rock. And that show gave us $100 million in cash flow year in and year out, long after the show was off the air. One of the great success stories in television business that I had absolutely nothing to do with. But it was, <laughs> um, but it was a great cash flow to have there. And uh, today, you make Seinfeld for Netflix. Guess what? 
It's the number one show on Netflix. You may or may not know that. And you ain't going to see any money in the back end. Because 15 years from now, you'll be like, wow, do we get the rights back? They own it in 150 countries. They own it in all medium. Tough. The business has changed dramatically, you know, that way. And so getting that data out of the SVOD providers is going to be one of the big, uh, I think, dynamics that you're going to see, you know, unfold here when certain stars and producers are going to say, my show, Stranger Things, Ozarks, uh, Handmaid's Tale is doing monumentally better than the other shows and driving subscriptions. Where's my money? You're going to see uh, tension in, in trying to release that data and trying to capture that. And trust me, the agents and the powerful writers and producers and actors and actresses are going to say, you know, we need to have some variability in what you're paying for this stuff versus just a kind of flat rate game that they very smartly put in place. So we've seen it, uh, you know, that way we don't as producers today go and look at data and say, you know, how would that inform what show we're making? We do look at all the social media information when we decide what hosts are going to host American Idol or So You Think You Can Dance in the same way you were t Nick was talking about personality brands. Trust me, Katy Perry is the highest paid person in television today as our host <laughs> of American Idol for a couple of reasons. Obviously, huge fan base there. She has 28 million followers on Instagram. When she talks about a star she loves, people pay attention. And it has become a unbelievable marketing tool between Twitter and Instagram to drive awareness. You can only look at our president when he says, hey, the media is not giving me a fair shake. He's used Twitter very effectively to get his messaging out there. And these stars, Luke Bryan and Lionel Richie, and particularly Katie uh, on the show, uh, every day have a business of putting tweets out that help support not only their own musical careers, but also this very important franchise for them. So it, it has shifted. Wow, well, there's a lot there. Um, I want to put a pin in the, the Netflix discussion because I want to come back, uh, talk a little bit about data, but come back to see whether they really have an advantage and how big of an advantage versus other, of the other media companies. But let's kind of step back about data right now. How is data used? What are the principal use functions for data? Uh, is it valuation? You mentioned, Nick, earlier about deciding what shows to make, deciding how, whether shows why they failed or why they succeeded maybe how to market. Can you walk through sort of the different ways that YouTube was, and then maybe Ward, you could kind of step in as, because you're dealing with a lot of media companies too. How do sure. you use data? Well, Ward will say that you can use data to make every decision better. Mm -hmm. uh, well, almost him, every decision. Let him speak to that. Uh, he's right, by the way. Um, when to go to the bathroom? Yes, 100%. Uh, okay. uh, I'm telling you, there's gonna be a weirdly strong positive correlation between hours after you've had Taco Bell and needing to go to the bathroom. Okay, all right, okay. <laughs> you got me. Um, but no, so, so you know, for us at YouTube, I think when it comes to data, I think the first misconception that people have is that it's a binary thing. Like by using data, I can tell you like, yep, that's gonna be a hit, and nope, that's gonna fail. And the reality is that, you know, like creating a, a series or a film is a very, very complicated product, right? You have thousands of, uh, creative people and crew members all involved with this. And as a result of that level of complexity, like it is an impossibility to say that like with you know, complete certainty, something will either succeed or fail. Right. Really what you're trying to do is, is baseball is the best analogy, where you're just trying to increase your batting average. If you can go in Hollywood from you know, having two out of 10 projects to being a hit instead of just one out of 10 projects, like, you know, you're, good. yeah, but you're going to be, you know, one of the most successful people in, in Hollywood at that point. It's just the mm -hmm. way that the business works. And so first and foremost, it's, it's trying to get people to understand that really what we're trying to do is not to kind of provide complete certainty, but it's trying to make sure that every decision that you made from, you know, the, the genre that you select to the topic that you focus on to the talent that you cast, that across each of, the, each of those decisions, you're making them just a little bit smarter. Mm -hmm. And at scale, over the long run, over a slate of you know, 30 projects over the course of a year, that's hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, for us, then you get to the question of like, well, what type of data are you looking for? And the reality is that we look for a mixture of quantitative and qualitative. 
So quant data, um, you know, it's it's a lot of what you think of when you think of Google, which is like, you know, what are of, of the you know, 90 hours of video content uploaded to YouTube every minute, like what are people actually watching? And so we do a lot of kind of, we have a data science team and we do a lot of mining and we kind of partner and like can use um, machine learning to try and understand like across all of those different videos, are there certain topics or genres that are, are popping? Um, and trying to use some predictive analytics to be like, okay, well, you know, if we see that, like if you were able to see you know, right before um, Twilight launched, that like there was this increasing resonance in culture around like supernatural romance. Mm -hmm. You might not have gotten, you know, Twilight, but you could have gotten the second and third project, which were also able to ride that wave mm -hmm. to fantastic success. So on the quant side, it's really trying to find the signal and the noise and being able to understand, you know, at scale across, you know, billions of data points, like what actually matters and what um, signifies that something could actually resonate with audiences. And then on the qualitative side, you know, we still find it's very valuable to go in and talk to users, like do ethnographic research, go into people's homes. Like if you see some interesting trend kind of amongst those billions of data points, like talk to people, understand like the why behind that trend which you're never going to be able to find with just pure numbers and quant data, and it's the why that can really sometimes provide that deepest insight. And you know, I think back to this one thing where we were, you know, we were trying, we, there was a couple different um, like documentaries and, and follow-on projects that we were looking at with different media stars, and we had a short list, and then um, we went into fans of each of these individual stars' homes. Because for us, we're like, okay, we see they have millions of social media stars, but like, who are the people that we think actually might go and like be so passionate that they would actually subscribe for, you know, a, a, a documentary on that. <coughs> and it was really close between a couple different people. And then we went into um, the homes to talk to fans of certain artists. And there was just like little things that we saw where we were like, this is the person. I mean, one of the fans, on t like some people they have, you know, their, their family's ashes, a beautiful painting, you know, the, the mantle in your home is a place of, of um, reverence. And this fan had just a crumpled up empty water bottle on their mantle. And we're like, this is weird, like we need to go understand this better. And so we went and we talked to them, like what, what's the story behind this? And the water bottle turned out to be a crumpled up water bottle that this musician just like threw off the stage in the middle of a concert and this fan grabbed it and put it in like the most reverent place in their home. Freddie Mercury, maybe. <laughs> and, and we saw like similar examples of that across the other fans whose homes we visited. And obviously, like it's small sample. You you don't want to kind of overjudge it, but it led to us kind of selecting which of those different artists we wanted to do a project with. And that project wound up being wildly successful for us. When I go to Ward, you sell content to me, to media companies. What's their principal use case? Why do they buy media from you, or buy data from you? Nick was right. You can use data for almost every decision, I think. Okay, but so it really it depends. It depends who you are. Like right. the answer really depends on who you are. So if you look at cross, select so like If you look at the flow of capital in the value chain, mm -hmm. and you think, let's put on the hat of every single decision maker throughout the value chain and look at what decision they're making, right? So you start at the very start of the value chain, um, say in, in the television business or the film business, and you go, okay, well, this is a hedge fund, right? I'm a fund, I'm a, a content investment fund. And the decisions that I have to make are usually about, do I invest in project A or project B? And how do I drive my slate de-risking process? And how do I decide who to partner with on a co from a co-production standpoint or co-investment standpoint. So if you're a content investment fund, we're starting to see a lot more you know, data-driven approaches by those folks. Now you move along and you go, okay, well, so you, there's a project, it's been invested in, and now you're a production company, and you're looking at, you've been commissioned. So what decisions do you have to make? Well, one, what projects do I accept? Two, how do I negotiate the best rates, right? You know, if we're, if I can say I want some variability in my compensation, <laughs> right? Like if I want some variability because if my show, 
you know, if I'm producing a Stranger Things or The Handmaid's Tale or, you know, some of the examples that you talked about, Dennis, if this show becomes the number one show globally, then I want to be compensated as such. Or if it does better than all your other original series, I want to be compensated as such. Um, so you move along the value chain, right? And you go, okay, so that's the production. So you, now you're a distribution company, and some of those are integrated, right? So they can be the same company. So you're a distribution executive, you're a salesperson. And, this is Dennis, he's right, selling. I mean, you're going and, but it's not, it's not, you're right. Like, this is happening here at a large scale, but I'm talking down to, you know, you are the head of sales for a studio in Eastern Europe, and you're meeting a Lithuanian broadcaster, right? And you're pitching, your, your format or TV show, and you're looking, to, you're trying to prove to them that there's actually demand for your title in Lithuania, and that they should really license it, that title from you as opposed to all the other content that they're seeing <coughs> at, MIP, at MIPCOM or MIP TV or whatever the, the, the content um, festival that you're at. It. And so, so now you're, you know, you're a sales, salesperson, you're using data to try to make better monetization decisions, price your content accordingly move alongside, along the, the value chain. Now, who sits on the opposite side of the salesperson as well, content programming, content acquisition executive? Now, the use case there is super simple. You have $10 to spend to license content. Now, you're either licensing content globally or you're licensing for individual market, depending on who you are and who you work for. And the decisions you have to make is, how do I spend that $10? What content do I license? What content do my audiences want? What content is in demand so that I can pay accordingly? Right. Then you move along. Now, content has been licensed. Right. It sits on a, prog uh, on, a on a network. It sits on an OTT platform um, or a cable channel. The next decision is how do I market it? Right. So now this is content has been invested in, being produced, being distributed, being sold, bought. Now, now it's about marketing it. So the decision as a marketer from you know, when and marketing teams are probably the single fastest growing user segment for us. Marketing teams are about okay, how do we? We've got this this content coming up. It's three months out before release. How do we really get it out there? How do we get it? Again, you have $10 of marketing budget to spend. How do we spend it? Do I run campaigns on Instagram and Twitter? Is that where my audiences are? Do I, do I put billboards up? Like, how do I decide where to invest my marketing budget? Um, and these decisions become fairly complex fairly quickly, particularly when you think of like global platforms, when you have to allocate marketing budgets for pieces of content across you know, 150 markets or, or more. So, so then there's marketing teams. So, so, so the answer is, it depends who you are. Okay, right. great. And, that was a, but I think a great sort of, tutorial yeah. for, the, for this audience and such. I just well, want to interject with one please. thing. Please. Um, although it's, it's very evident that you can use all of the data to create a lucrative business and follow the trends and create content that might not be the premiere, but is a second and third and is lucrative, I sincerely hope that that doesn't discourage um, content makers to also give a chance to like the anomaly, you know, something that doesn't fit the data, doesn't fit the trends, is completely out of the box, but could be creative enough um, to really make it. Because otherwise, within a few years, we're just going to get into this kind of lull of the same shows being created for the same audiences, and they'll buy it, they'll eat it up. But I, I do hope that there is also room for something that's going to break the mold, that's going to go against all of the data. So not all decisions can be uh, made with, the, with, with the use of data. I think that there's always space for innovation, even in a, a, a proven working model. That's a phenomenal point, right? I think and that's a super interesting conversation to have here on the panel because that's sort of the number one thing that when we go to creators and say, we're not going to tell you how to do your job, right? And you know, there's a long answer and a short answer. The, 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 the short answer is, you know, one of, uh, one of our board members, Bruce Tuckman, once, I wanna give him credit, was, once on a, was on a panel and was asked the same question, is this going to stifle creativity? Mm -hmm. And he said, he said, well, think of creators as artists, like painters, right? We're not telling a painter how to, how to paint their masterpiece. We're giving them a better brush, right? It's a better brush. It doesn't, we're not telling them how to set their vision, how to paint the actual painting. It's a better tool that they can use to better portray their art. So that's the short answer. The long answer is, I think, you talked about the concept of machine learning, Nick. I think that's the, dif that's the primary difference between statistics and machine learning, right? And data science, when it, well, I get asked that question a lot. And, you know, uh, traditional stats is more, you know, you think of what the music business did, right? And it created this formula for creating hits and you did end up with more of the same, right? Like more and more of the same type of acts. And some of those have been mentioned here. And there's a formula to creating those. But, but what that's <coughs> never going to give you is a genre-defining act. What that's not going to give you is 
you mentioned Freddie Mercury, right? It's not going to give yeah. you that. It's not going to give you a, a Michael Jackson or, or the Beatles. It's not going <coughs> to give you something that creates an entirely new genre. From mm -hmm. scratch, the genre doesn't exist. You can't say, oh, this has worked, therefore this is going to work. I think what data science is now allowing us to do is actually look at the white spaces, right? Look at the gaps, look at where there is unmet demand for content, for something new to be innovative. We don't know what it is, right? We're not going to tell the creator exactly what it is, but we know that there's a gap here. Um, this area hasn't been addressed before. It's so. interesting. So you can find white spaces and such. Kay, what do you think? Um, I agree with that. I think that each year or each time you run the data, you get an idea of what is working, but you also get an idea of what hasn't been met or mm -hmm. isn't working. And so that's an area to grow into. And that is going to consistently change because as you find these gaps, you'll fill them and then that'll create a new one and a new one. So it'll just be an ever-changing cycle. So I want to go back quickly to this Netflix discussion we had about that data that they have. Does Netflix, Amazon have a big advantage over the traditional media pyramids because of all the data, first party data they have? And is that going to continue to get worse? You want to put Google up there as well on the list? Oh, the first party <laughs> data. Uh, ooh, Google, oh, uh, Google yeah. and YouTube, the same company. Oh, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> all right, bad guy. Um, let me not ask the Google guy that. All right, Dennis, what do you think? Uh, big advantage, I'm going to come back to you, Nick, so you can be ready. Hard to even express how big an advantage that those players have, having real time data, what device they're on, when they tune it off, how long they stay on, what that person purchased before and after. I mean, nobody closer to the purchase decision than Amazon. So as Harry was talking about Amazon earlier, they have you know that, that connection between, oh, if you're watching this, you purchase that. You know, they have probably the best uh, data for uh, affecting and, and growing their consumer uh, commerce base here than, than anything I've ever seen in my lifetime. <laughs> and compared to ABC puts American Idol on, it reaches today about 10 million people on Sunday night. And they have very limited, you know, kind of categorical data that they've been selling the same way to advertisers for a long time. Mm -hmm. Versus, you know, what is now, I talked to, I met the guy who does Netflix uh, branding. Uh, not for the Netflix service, but branding within shows there, which I didn't even know existed. <laughs> mm -hmm. And he said, talk about great information to how to figure out where to put Coca-Cola in Stranger Things. And it's being done very subtly, but the advertisers love it because it's so specific. And I got to think Google and uh, along with the rest oh, of the Oh, Google wouldn't do something like that, would they? No, no, no never. <laughs> but maybe Elizabeth Warren will separate all these companies. <laughs> yeah. and, Come back uh, in a year. And we'll yeah, have a Chinese wall. Won't exist. And uh, I'm not, you know, I mean, it may be all a little bit early and fanciful, but I think there is going to be a groundswell of support about, you know, not only on privacy issues, but on, hey, do these companies need to be in all of these businesses and where... Where do we draw the lines here? And it's way too early to tell. But I think there's going to be I think wonderfully the provocative. I mean, the power of data and those who have it versus Absolutely. those who don't. Amazon knows what I purchased for my personal use, what I purchased for my business, what I watch. Uh, and what, what you I, said in your living room, too. Yeah, what, 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 <laughs> everything. They know, they know everything. It's just such a wide range of knowledge into every single part of my life. And that goes for everyone. So, Nick, come on. Well, I, yeah, I mean, I think, so, it's, I agree with what everyone's saying. I think it's a huge advantage, but I think it's not going to be a competitive advantage for much longer because fundamentally what you're seeing is consolidation in a, a lot of different areas in the media business and the launch of direct-to-consumer offerings. Like, Disney is, like, very much understands the power of data and with their new you know, three-pronged subscription offering that they're going to be launching. They really don't have a lot of data. But they will. Context. It'll take them years to... I mean, they, they won't have the scale, right. but they'll have the relevant data that they will need to kind of understand some of the basic things about just, like, who's watching, like, demo, gender, kind of... It'll... I think it'll provide... a tremendous amount of value very quickly for them now that they're going to have the direct-to-consumer relationship. I'm standing in between here and lunch for this, but Ward, last, last point. How, how does your data help someone compete with Netflix and Amazon and Google? Or does it? Well, so, <laughs> a you know, softball here. some of the, yeah, look, I, uh, disclaimer, 
our biggest clients are the ones who have the biggest data sets on the planet. And that's just, an interesting point. And it says, and I get asked like, why is that the case? They value data more, right? And so they understand the incremental value. So those who have data value data a lot more. Well, absolutely. You go in a don't. studio, you know, executive who's never ever made a data you know, data driven um, decision, but an actual empirically data driven decision before it hasn't been part of the process and it's very difficult to actually talk about all these use cases and how you can make them better. Um, but I think for, for everyone else in the industry what we do is essentially say you can have capability that's very close to that of the ones that are you know have access to hundreds of millions of people's first party data um, and you can do that much more cost efficiently because you know your local producer there's no chance right. otherwise. Yeah. That's it folks. Enjoy your lunch. Thank you very much. Thank you.